So um, let's go ahead and talk about these guys quickly. Uh, phylum hemichordata, what hemi means almost. Um, so these are the organisms that they have, out of uh, five characteristics of chordates, they have three of them. So they call them hemichordata. And um, they have dorsal nerve uh, cord, they have gill slits, which you do have them. I will go over those five, the big five major characteristics of chordate animals. Um, I'll go over five of them. But these guys, phylum hemichordata, they have three of them. Out of five, they have three of them. They are also, they are referred to as a, a lesser durostrum. They are durostrum animals. They are coelomate animals. True coelom, eel coelomate animals, hemichordata are. And uh, so they call them lesser durostrum. Echinoderms are also durostrum, right? The only phylum we studied so far that is durostrum was <coughs> echinoderms, the starfish, sea cucumber. And these guys are uh, another group, the next group. Um, Eocelomate, acorn, one example of this an animal in this group is acorn, characteristic of chordate, and echinoderms, both. It has characteristic of, uh, and this is the acorn worm. There are three body parts of acorn, uh, proboscis, this portion is proboscis, and then you have the trunk right here is the trunk, all of, it, it indicated all of this is the trunk, and then what else? A uh, collar, which is this area around the mouth right here. Don't worry about the rest of the anatomy of this animal. Just know it has, this is acorn, and it has three body parts. And that's where the proboscis trunk, uh, the big mouth, bulk of the body is the trunk, and the collar is another portion of the mouth. Okay, these are the five main characteristics of chordate animals. You had them. Every animal that has chordate, right, the vertebrae, they are chordate, they have vertebrae in the back, they have these five, five characteristics. Uh, notochord. You did have notochord when you were in your mother's womb. Okay? I'm not talking about these five characteristics ex uh, exist throughout all of the life of the animal. You do not have notochord now. But when you were in your mother's womb, you did have it, okay? The next one, dor dorsal tubular nerve cord. All other animals we studied so far, the nerve cords, if this is digestive system, the nerve cord was on the ventral portion of, this is the ventral portion of the animal. The nerve cord was on the ventral portion of the animal. These guys evolved that the nerve cord is on top of the digestive tract. This digestive tract and the nerve cord is on top of it. So that's, all you, that's what they call a dorsal nerve cord. Your nerve cord, right? Your uh, spinal cord in the back is on back of you, not in front of you, relative to your digestive tract. You're talking about uh, the landmark is your digestive tract. Pharyngeal pouches and gill slits. Again, when you were in your mother's womb, you had gill slits. You had gills. Okay? But later on, that gill became, in your mother's womb, became lungs, okay? Um, thyroid gland, and if they do not, some of the animals do not have thyroid gland, but they have a structure called endostyle, see? And post-anal tail, again, we do have a tailbone, the coccyx, right? But when you were in your mother's womb again, it was longer. As your development, we are <coughs> focusing on human, but other animals, monkeys, you all have, know they have tails, um, but as you, it's getting closer to your birth, to that you come to the, this world, uh, your tailbone shrinks, 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 shrinks. Some people's tailbone does not shrink. They are born with an elongated tailbone. So what happens, the surgeons, right after uh, the baby is born, they go ahead and cut it off. Not right after, don't hold me. Uh, it might be a few days or a month, and then they cut the tailbone so the person can sit on the chair. Evolutionary-wise, that's an advantage for us animals, for we human, that we do not have a tailbone, okay? We do not have a long tail. We do have a tailbone, but we do not have a long tail. Why? Because we can sit down and use our, the way we were designed, use our hand. That was often quite, I asked that a question on your final, um, what is the difference between us and horses? It's in your vertebrate handout. If horses had the mentality of us, what is it that we have, they don't have? 
One of them is a tail, a uh, long tail, and the other one we can use our hand. But anyhow, I'm getting tension. I hope I don't do that for the rest of the day. But anyhow, post anal tail. So these are the five characteristics. All, all the vertebrae have, okay? At one time or another throughout their life. Hemichordata had only three of them. All of these five, hemichordata had only three of them. Okay, here is a drawing of it. Don't worry about the rest of it, but the five, uh, the five uh, big, uh, the big five are pharyngeal gill slits, right here. They have it, dorsal hollow nerve tube, nerve cord, on top of digestive tract. Then this is notochord and post anal tail. This is anus, and they have a tail after that. Okay, and then what was the other one? Post anal tail, a notochord, um, dorsal nerve tube, pharyngeal gill splits, and I think that's it. That's five of them, isn't it? But, um, huh? Thyroid gland, yes, right here. They didn't mean, they didn't put it down. It should be right around here. You should have thyroid gland. They didn't mention it. They forgot it. Okay, coordinate characteristics. Thank you. Endostyle or thyroid gland. It's, it's usually around right here. You have it. Thyroid gland, right here. Okay. Uh, not the cord. Uh, generally, uh, what it is, it's a connective tissue, um, and uh, it is right here. These are the cells. Outside of the cells is a fibrous sheath, uh, connective tissue, and out of outside of the connective tissue is elastic sheath. What does notochord, uh, of course, it's, it supports the animal. Uh, muscles can attach to it. These are some of the advantages of notochord. And allows the animal to be flexible, to move. We can, we can do that. If we could not do it, we had to be rigid, always like this. It was not advantageous in evolutionary way, in evolution. So over a period of time, um, animals that do not have vertebrae like us, but they have uh, notochord, uh, they can move, they can move around, okay? That's make them flexible, right? Okay, couple, uh, this term, I would, it is important for the next section when I'm gonna talk about evolution. Um, you should know uh, that term, cladogram. Cladogram, you had it in your prefix and suffix, it is, a, I believe, it's a branching diagram showing the pattern of uh, sharing evolutionary uh, derived characteristics among species of higher taxa. What it is, it is that, you know, all of these animals right here, all of these animals here, they had a common ancestor. And that's what Darwin proposed. And that's what you're gonna talk about after uh, we are done with vertebrae, we are gonna get to evolution. And I will talk about that in a minute. They, they had a common ancestor, and that common ancestor, for some reason, environmental conditions, and so on and so forth, which we'll talk about it. And Lamarck talked, said something else, and uh, Darwin came said uh, something different, and anyhow, Darwin theory is more accepted now uh, than Lamarck, and I will talk about all of that in a minute. But here, the common ancestor we had, and they branched out, and they went to different environments. And environment also is playing a big factor in the evolution of the organisms, okay? So it's just not the organism, uh, environment and genetics, both. Darwin did not know anything about genetics, but uh, what he said, uh, it fit in with genetics later on, but I will talk about it. Okay, this is formation of the gill, the evolution of the gill, it is important. Uh, to some extent, your textbook talks about it. The very first animals, they had a, a pharynx. <clears throat> it was not powerful, and they had cilia, and the mouth was here. They had cilia, and then uh, around the mouth, and then they had a pharynx. And they evolved, uh, and they evolved to a powerful pharynx, a muscular pharynx. And you saw that in nematodes, you saw that in annelids, the pharynx was powerful, muscular, uh, especially when you dissected the uh, earthworm, you saw the powerful pharynx. And after that, they had gill. Animals evolved, the mouth was still there, no presence of cilia or not, uh, they had powerful pharynx still, but around the pharynx, they evolved to a capillary, bit of capillary for exchange of oxygen and, and nutrient, and then eventually went to the gills. So the animals were able to use oxygen more, uh, more efficiently, I should say. And, uh, 
uh, evolution of mitochondria occurred. So mitochondria gave the animal more power, more energy, so the animal could evolve more and more and more. But what am I saying? The beginning of it was right here, development of capillary around gills and around pharynx uh, gave the animal that power. That's why evolution of gills and eventually the lungs, life began from the ocean, from the sea. Okay, so gills pre-existed lungs. I hope that, and that's true for all animals. All of the arthropods we study, all of the vertebrae we are going to study a little bit, everything else. So gear, uh, gills were formed first, and evolution of the gills is just right here. I hope I'm making some sense. But you have to consider that the life began in the ocean, in the sea. Okay, that's what most everybody agrees. Okay, here is <clears throat> an organism that is sessile, a, a, a cord I gave you subphylum uricordata, uh, with a tunicate is an example. It's a very interesting animal, tunicate. We used to have, uh, when we used to spend uh, two, three weeks uh, on vertebrae, uh, we used to have slide of them and uh, both uh, the adult and um, the larva stages. The larva stages uh, sessile, move around in the sea, and the adult uh, settles, sits on the bottom of the ocean, and <coughs> being adult. Okay, adults are sessile. In adults, not the cord and tail disappears. Endostyle secretes mucus, so they do have endostyle. And right here is one thing about. Um, um, one thing about these guys, the uh, tunicate, uh, they are the only animal I know, you might go to the internet and search it, they have cellulose. This tunica, which is made up of tunic, is made up of cellulose. How these animals make cellulose, you know cellulose is for plants. They do for bio one. Today I refer to bio one a lot. I'm sorry about that. Um, refresh some of your bio one uh, terminology. And if, if, if something I say, that is from bio one, and you forgot. I forgot I too this morning. So, tell me, Amir, what do you mean by this? Uh, I will, I will talk about it. I will quickly rephrase it from bio one, and then we move on. So don't get lost just because of you forgot the information from bio one. Okay. So tunic is the structure outside of the animal right here that is made up of cells. Now still up to this day, there are theories. But up to this day, this is a, a why, how, not why, how these animals make cellulose. We don't. Okay, that's still, this is an animal that makes cellulose, and we still do not know. Okay, the other organism is cephalom, uh, 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 cephalocordata amphioxus. Uh, we, we had a lot of amphioxus, and has five characteristics of chordates, no heart, but closed circulatory system. Um, uh, and then what happens, these animals, uh, they uh, embed themselves in the sand uh, of the ocean and their head is on top and of course uh, food and water gets in and it's being filtered through their uh, gill slits and move on. So there are theories, these are our ancestors, uh, we evolved from, these are the very, very first chordate animals, not hemichordata, this is not acorn, this is a true chordate animal, okay? <clears throat> and it has all five characteristics as well. Okay, subphylum vertebrate otter, the vertebrate animals. So you're talking about <clears throat> living endoskeleton. We have our endoskeleton is living, okay? Yeah, it means they have cells, osteocytes, as we talked about at the beginning of the semester. Osteocytes, uh, osteoclast, osteoblast, so on and so forth. And then, of course, there's blood vessel in them. It's a vascularized structure. Our bone is a vascularized structure. We have blood vessel in them. Okay, pharynx and efficient respiration, closed circulatory system with capillaries, paired limbs, and advanced nervous system. And in case of human, of course, we can think and analyze information. Not only can think, some people, uh, all of that, again, you know, let's move on. Um, here is the lamprey, or hagfish, uh, not a lamprey, it's a hagfish. They attach the uh, gills of, uh, right here, they attach the fishes 
and they suck blood. Um, again, uh, this is similar to lamprey. It's not the lamprey, and um, they uh, again don't worry about anatomy of it and so on and so forth. Uh, they have caudal fin right here, same as lamprey. Lamprey has a caudal fin as well, and there are three different type of fin. I will a caudal fin. I will talk about that. There are two terms I would like you to know. Anadromous, you probably have heard of it before, and catadromous. Anadromous animals are animals, fishes, sorry about that, fishes, not uh, animals, fishes that migrate from the ocean, from the sea, salt water. That's the catch. They migrate from salt water to fresh water, uh, streams to spawn, uh, salmon, lampreys, they are examples of anadromous animals. So they go from sea to the pond, and they lay eggs. Some of these animals, after they spawn, they lay eggs, they die. Salmon is one example of them. Okay. Opposite of that is catadromous animals. Catadromous animals, fishes that migrate from fresh water, lakes, ponds, rivers, so on and so forth, to ocean, to salt water, to uh, spawn. And an example of that would be a meal. You go to sushi restaurants, sometimes you eat eel. Is that right? Okay. Um, here is a picture of it. And then, uh, of course, I have a picture of the lamprey uh, that attached to the fish. And they are the largest ectoparasite. Sometimes I ask that in an exam, uh, final exam. Who, who, which of the following animal is the largest ectoparasite? So they attach to the fishes and suck blood. And that's how they live. That's their uh, huge. And I do have lamprey here. I can show it to you guys. Patch. Yeah. Do they typically die in both cases after spawning? Or? Eel is usually not like that. <coughs> but uh, lamprey is not like that. The only, one, uh, the only examples that I have here is a salmon. Salmon, usually they die in most cases. Yes. Uh, no. Uh, yes. Large, uh, lamprey is the largest Yes, some text we say. Okay, ichthyology, let's get to the fishes quickly. Uh, study of fishes. Fishes is true when you are talking about different species of fish. I'm being recorded and being on, put on YouTube. You can argue with your English teacher. As long as you're talking about different species of fish. But if you're talking about one fish, one, one species of fish like salmon, then you cannot use the term fishes. But you can do either. You can say there are uh, five different type of fish in this tank. Am I making some sense? Uh, one of them is salmon, one of them is eel, one of them is that, one of them is that. Uh, you can't say either one. Or you can say there are five different type of fishes in the tank. Different, different fishes. Salmon, eel, and so on and so on. Um, jawless fish, hagfish, and lamprey. Uh, jawed fish, the bony and cartilaginous. So the animals that are jawed fish, they have a jaw, uh, they are broken into two groups. The group that are cartilaginous, the whole and like shark, the whole entire animal is made up of cartilage. And then of course, bony fishes, which are, um, it seems like it, uh, they evolved later. Uh, bone, um, Again, it depends what your recent edition of the textbook says, but it seems like it, that bone evolved from um, cartilage. Okay, and then vertebral column replaced a notochord in these animals. Uh, we talked about that. Um, here is a shark. Shark cannot see very well, but they have a very keen uh, sense of um, uh, smell and vibration in the water. The name of the structure is uh, neuromast cells, lateral lines, uh, Lorenz, here we go. Ampulla of Lorenzi, a, a structure called Lorenzini structure in these animals that they can, um, don't worry about anatomy of it, all I want you to know a little bit is the Lorenzini, that you should know Lorenzini uh, apparatus structure that can sense the vibration of the water, the smell, so on and so forth. They see a little bit of blood, they're attracted to it. Okay, that's what happens with these animals or writers. Okay, these are <coughs> uh, the main uh, fins. Uh, you should know these, the name of these fins. 
because when we talk about evolution, or when you take an, a course of evolution later on, they come in handy, okay? So uh, the, the dorsal fins, you have two of them. Some fishes have two, some fishes have one. And then caudal fin, I will talk about different type of caudal fin. There are three different type of caudal fin, and I will talk about that in a minute. Anal fin, and then you have pelvic fin and pectoral fin. These are the three fins in different species that evolve when the, when the fishes evolve to amphibians and amphibians to reptiles and reptiles to other animals. And what happens, these are the ones that evolve to the arms and legs. That's what the evolution, that's why it's so important about uh, pectoral uh, fin, pelvic fin, and anal fin. Not so much of anal fin, but uh, those two, uh, pectoral and pelvic fin. Okay, three different type of fin, uh, caudal fin, Caudal, it means tail, as you all know. Uh, heterocircle, it means the two branches are not equal. Okay, and it's like shark. Shark is an example of heterocircle uh, fin. And then a caudal fin. And then a diphycircle, it just looks like that. This is, uh, it's not uh, like they are not equal. They are equal, like perch, bass, all of the Fishes usually, uh, you see most of them are like this. They are heterohomocircle, it means both, uh, both end of the uh, caudal fin are equal. And diphycircle, like one fish, uh, lamprey, uh, <coughs> these are examples of them. Another thing about fishes you should know is different type of, we do have slide of them, uh, we do have different type of um, scales, okay? And also, you should know which scale belongs to what group of animals, what group of fishes. Okay, so the first one, do not worry about anatomy of these, all of the different uh, structures, but the first one is placoid uh, type of scale. The placoid scales belong to cartilaginous fishes, like shark. Okay, fishes that are completely uh, made up of shark, uh, made up of cartilage, are placoid. Then you have ganoid scales, they are non-telost bony fish. Non-telost bony fish, these are the fishes that are, look like the ancient fishes, old, old fishes that they are, uh, we have fossil record of. Um, for example, let me, I'm making, I'm comparing orange and apples. When you look at the horseshoe crab, something we talked about, I'm making, uh, uh, comparing apples and oranges. Horseshoe crab, we talk, We said they are walking fossils. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Because they look like fossil records. Or the larva, the larva of horseshoe crab, uh, the young of, uh, look like, the larva of some of these animals look like trilobita, right? Trilobita. So same as these guys. They do look like, if you look at the fish, they do look like uh, the old non-telos, they call it non-telos, bony fish, and they are, have ganoid, uh, type of uh, scale. Then we have cycloid, the bony fishes, the modern, telos, it means modern bony fishes. Okay, then they are telos, uh, then we have cycloid and tenoid, sea silent, cycloid and tenoid type of scales. So there are two types of scales for modern bony fishes, and they are cycloid and tenoid scales. Again, the cladogram of evolution of the fishes. They evolve from a common ancestor to a variety of different type of fish. Herpetology. I'm all done with ichthyology. Let's go to herpetology. Herpetology, a uh, double life of amphibians. Uh, let's talk about amphibians first. Ectothermic, it means the temperature of the outside, whatever it is, the body temperature changes and adopt to that, to the temperature of the outside. Fishes are also ectothermic. Amphibians, reptiles, the only endothermic, true, warm-blooded animals we have, you learned this in the school, is uh, mammals and birds. Those are not uh, ectothermic. Heart has three chambers, two, uh, I'll show you a picture, two atria and one ventricle, and spiral, I put it in red, uh, spiral valve is a valve that separates oxygenated blood and non-oxygenated blood. Um, that is still is a mystery how these two blood do not get mixed up in four chambered animals like us. Our heart has four chambers. We know that. It's not a mystery. 
But these guys, they have a, um, a spiral valve uh, in the ventricle and the blood does not get mixed up. Uh, we still, uh, they're still up for the grab. Uh, some of them are poisonous, of course. Some of the frogs, you know, they're poisonous. Uh, uh, respiration by mouth, skin, and lung. Uh, so the respiration occurs, uh, they're vet, uh, I'm talking about amphibians again, not reptiles. So uh, most, uh, all amphibians that I know, their skin, even though when they come to the land, the early stages of the animal is in the water. Think of frog. But when frog comes to the land, they do not live in desert. I don't know any frog that lives in desert, okay? So when they come to the land, they might live in a desert, but lives around a pond in a desert area. I might make it somewhere wet. So their skin always have to be moist, uh, these amphibians. So respiration occurs through the skin as well, and of course through the mouth, and then uh, they have lungs and nose. Uh, brain has uh, 10 cranial nerves. I don't know, you studied that you dissected frog uh, in high school or not. You dissected the brain, and then after you dissected the brain, there are 10 nerves, uh, 10 uh, from this side and 10 from this side, from both sides, pairs. As I, I hope I said, I didn't say pairs. 10 pairs of ner nerves comes, comes off from the brain and goes to the rest of the body. For us, it's 12. For us, is 12. For them, for amphibians, and I'll mention them as we go along. Um, therefore, the, uh, if you dissect the frog when you were in high school. Okay. Uh, this is the heart. Don't worry about all of this. The only thing I want to show you is that there are three chambered heart, um, two atrium. You remember at the beginning of semester, and one ventricle and um, spiral valve is the one right here that does not allow uh, the oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood get mixed up. And then how does that work? We still uh, don't know. Here is um, population of frogs, uh, male uh, clasps, females, and the name of that process, that, that, that process is called ampulexis and egg fertilized as they are uh, shed. So uh, in, in reality, something about frog, they, they have to clasp. Okay, the term is class when they come together. Uh, fertilization is external. Male release the sperm, female release the egg, and the sperm and egg are fertilized outside uh, like fishes. Okay, fishes, most fishes do this. Fertilization is external, and same as these guys. Fertilization is external, it's not inside of and of course, as you know, uh, we looked at this at the beginning of semester, the frog development, we looked at it at the beginning of semester. <clears throat> Herpetology. Herpetology is study of reptiles. Okay, so um, uh, reptilian, first vertebrate on that. Okay, um, before, before, Reptiles get to land. What other animals? Oops, sorry. What other animals were on land? We studied this. Arachnid. Yes, the arthropods, and they flourished, as you know. They flourished because there was no competition, and I will talk about that. Why they flourished? Because there was no competition. Something Darwin talked about it as well. Um, he went to Galapagos Island. How come those tortillas, you know those tortillas, how come they became so huge? And that's only in Galapagos Island. They became <laughs> so huge because those giant turtles. Is that right? The tortoise. 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 I'm sorry, I said tortoise. I told you about it. Tortoise. Yeah, Jose laughed because he knows I'm hungry. Those tortoises. <laughs> I can't remember I do how about the rest, I don't know. But the tortoise, the tortoise, they became huge because they, I'm, I'm glad you're not sleeping. You know, you're all, they, uh, they became so huge because there was no competition, there was no predators. That's why they became so huge. Nowhere else, nowhere else on planet Earth they became that big. Because turtles always have competition, always have uh, predators, okay? So anyhow, we will get to that. 
Uh, first, vertebrate animals on land, occipital condyle, I will talk about that there, but for now, uh, I have to show you some pictures. Occipital condyle is um, a structure on the back of, opening in the back of the eye. On the back of the skull, uh, we have one, uh, but, uh, but some animals have two, some animals have none, and I will talk about occipital condyle. Three chambered heart, except uh, crocodilians, crocodiles, and um, what was the other? What is the cousin of crocodiles? Alligators. Uh, alligators. Okay. They they have four <coughs> chambered heart. They have four chambered heart. Cranial nerves, twelve of them. Twelve on this side, twelve on that side. Uh, frogs, amphibians, ten of them. Those are the numbers I'm hoping you remember. It's easy. So there are not too many numbers I'm hoping you remember for the final, but you should know these are. Okay, uh, different uh, from amphibians, of course, they are different. Outside temperature determines the sex of the animal. I, on your, um, on your uh, board documents in DocuShare, I gave you a rundown of what is what. I didn't repeat it here, maybe I did. I but, uh, uh, but you should know that. What, at what temperature, uh, the, the, the offspring becomes the egg, becomes male, and what temperature they uh, becomes female. Here is the evolution that I, I was talking about, pectoral fin. They are becoming the forelimb and hind limb. Okay, so that's the evolution of the uh, fins becoming uh, forelimbs and hind limbs uh, in this group of animals. Here's a cladogram of uh, amphibians, reptiles, Okay, this is what I was hoping. Okay, there, there are three, there are three um, skulls, main skulls that you should uh, kind of know a little bit. Uh, just know the definitions and some examples. Anapsid animals, they have one opening for the eye. In the back of the skull, they do not have any more openings. Those are called an, and it means in front of a word in biology means what? Wow. Without. So anapsid animals, they are animals that they do not have opening in the back of the skull. Then synapsid animals, like us, mammals, they have one opening behind the eye orbit. Okay, one opening. Mammals. Uh, uh, anapsid animals like a turtle. Okay, those are anapsid. Uh, synapsid animals like human. Then you have diapsid, die, it means what? On your prefixes and uh, it means two. They have two openings in the back of the skull. They have two openings. And an example of that would be birds and so on and so forth. Uh, they are, uh, so they are examples of diapsid. Avians, let's go to the avies quickly. Uh, avies are avians ornithology, study of birds. Of course, in major universities, you go to Davis. I don't know about UOP, maybe. Uh, yeah, UOP did, but I don't know, UOP does it now, or Davis Berkeley, they offer a course for a whole entire semester, ornithology, or herpetology, or mammalogy, for a whole entire semester, you study those animals, you memorize their name, of course, in ornithology, I remember I had some friends, I didn't take ornithology, uh, but I had friends who took it when I was in Minnesota, they used to get up early in the morning, 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning to go, uh, hear the birds. And of course, guess what the lab practical exam was? The teacher played the tape. Those times there was a tape. It was not YouTube. Played the tape, and based on the songs of the bird, they had to write down the name of the bird. If you're, uh, and look at her mouth. Her jaw is hitting the floor. <laughs> so if you're taking ornithology, expect that. Expect that you have to identify the animals by their sound. And that would be your lab practical exam, portion of your lab practical exam. Okay, uh, Archaeopteryx uh, lithographica. Uh, it's an ancient bird, and um, this was found in the uh, it's a fossil. It's a, it's a, this bird does not exist anymore. Okay, guys, and um, uh, it's an ancient bird. Uh, Archaeo it means ancient. Pteryx it means wing. Litho it means stone. 
and graph the proteins picture. So these, uh, the, I'll show you a picture. This animal was found first in Germany, and then that's what the name they gave. And of course, they are saying, they are believing that uh, you should know this. I don't think it's anywhere in my PowerPoint that uh, birds evolved from uh, reptiles. Okay, first were reptiles, and the reptiles. Uh, there are two theories how they evolved. Um, you might think it's crazy, but that's why the reptiles went on top of a cliff, and they jumped down in order to then fly. Of course, they died, <laughs> right? If you look at four or five editions ago in your, or the other theory is the animal was on the ground, and over a period of time, they learned how to fly, okay? Four or five editions ago in your textbook, the same textbook, same author, they said this is the most like, scientists, authorities, believe the most accepted one is the one that they were on the ground and they learned how to fly, okay? That's the most accepted one. If you look at your own, the, your textbook edition now, you will see the same first one I mentioned, they went on top of a cliff and they jumped down. And of course they died, but some of them are successful over a period of time and they evolved into how to fly. Okay, so things change in science. Okay, because, and most of that is because of the fossil records they get. We don't know what happened in the past. We don't have a movie of it. We don't have an item of it. But uh, it's because of the fossil records. A lot of things have changed, you know, constantly changed. They find, how do they find these fossil records? Anybody? Oil and gold. People who are looking for oil. I mean, people are not uh, rich enough like me to go and dig the ground and just look for fossil records. No, they're digging the ground to find oil or gold. And that's how they come across fossils. And then they give it to people like me who does not know anything about fossils. And then we sit down and make an knowledge. You saw videos that I showed you. There was a basement, tons and tons of fossil records. Okay, And a lot of what Darwin said, <clears throat> I will get to it. A lot of what Darwin said, it's based on the fossil records and based on his traveling that he did around the world, uh, the voyage of Beagle, and I will talk about that. So a lot of evolution that we are talking about, just like birds, that is changing the theory that they learn from ground to go up or from the top of a cliff to come down, it's changing. And based on fossil records, based on the fossil records. Okay, different types of feather. Of course, um, there are different types of feathers. Um, sternum and kill. These animals have a sternum, just like us, but they have a kill, uh, another bone up here which uh,